Welcome, everybody, into another edition of the Big Ten Show. I am your host, Adam a character. I've got a special guest today, and I can't wait to bring him on. But before we do, all right, I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, which is Bonzel Pool, bonzelpool.com. You can check them out there. Jeff Bonzel, the owner, phenomenal guy. They're literally digging up my backyard as we speak. We're creating big, gigantic holes. Okay, hopefully they're going to put a pool in its place. Uh, that's the idea anyways. So they're putting in my own family's pool as we move back to Lincoln this summer. My kids get out of school here, oh, God, in a week. So pray for me because I'm going to need it. But we're going to have a pool, and they can spend all day out there once, once we get back to Lincoln. But it's bonzelpools.com. But I want to bring on my guest at this point in time. He does a great job talking all nebraska sports he's a great media personality within the state of nebraska i looked at his twitter bio he's also an mc for the omaha storm chasers as well as calling a whole whole plethora of other games baseball in particular i know co-host of the happy hour as well mr nick saner how you doing my friend adam character appreciate you having me on yeah no i apologize if my voice gives out at any point here uh today is going to be game 15 and 16 in the last four days of baseball so uh, we're, we're trying to rest the voice as much as possible, but I'm glad to be here. All right. So serious question. Cause I've had issues with my, I've, I think I've had walking pneumonia for like three weeks at this point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So my solution is to sit here with a million bottles of water and I basically just guzzle mm-hmm. them anytime I think I'm going to cough, uh, it creates yeah. an issue. Cause I pretty much live in the bathroom at that point. And then I'm trying to talk and sound somewhat intelligent. What advice do you have? For right now, my voice is actually pretty good. But in the future, when I'm struggling with my voice and trying to do my job. I I always, if I were to reach around in my backpack right now and grab uh, or look in there, there would be about three packs of Hall's breezers. Uh, So there's always (laughs) something that that I can can pop in my mouth if I need to. Gum, I think I'm I'm chewing gum right now. So uh, that, but then also at night, like a lot of it I've learned is prep, especially state basketball when there's like 42 games over the course of two weeks that we do. Um, yeah, we, we, I realized that, okay, I need to start slamming down the, the glasses of tea every single night before rest, obviously. And then just try not to talk to my people. And, and I'm, I'm not sure my girlfriend's a big fan of the, the not talking to her a big piece of that, but we'll, we'll, we'll call it good. <laughs> now you have an excuse to do what most guys do anyways, which is not talk to their girlfriend or wife. I guess you're, sounds like you're kind of getting in trouble, but it's gotta be diminished at least to a certain point. All right, let's talk yeah. some Nebraska. Yeah, football. no, it's all good. It's yeah. all good. I take I take her to a dinner. We're all good after after it. Everything, we're all good. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I, I assume you pick up the check and everything, kind of make it good to go oh, that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit of Nebraska football. Let's start with the quarterback room. And I'm going to shock people by not mm-hmm. starting with Dylan Raiola. I actually want to start with Heinrich Harburg, okay? To most people, he looks very improved. I talked no less than 80 billion times, and I'm rounding down when I say that about his throwing mechanics last year. They are improved. They've clearly been worked on. New quarterback coach Glenn yeah. Thomas, I believe, is helping him as much as anybody at this point in time. But talk to me about what you saw at the spring game and kind of what your expectations are for Heinrich Harburg this year. Well, I think overall, I think we're, we're learning also how much of just a, how much more benefit it is for Nebraska's offense when they have a quarterback's coach, right, that, that is in that room. Not that that's not a, that's not a, a slight at Marcus Satterfield. Also, I think last year there was just a situation where he was pulled away quite a few times from quarterbacks or from a certain position group because he had to worry about the entire offense. And that's that's him doing his job as the offensive coordinator. So I think Nebraska allowing to or Matt rule, bringing in a quarterback's coach and Glenn Thomas, like you mentioned, has been a, a very big benefit for every quarterback in that room. And especially mm-hmm. a guy like Hunter Carberg, where there was a lot of room to improve mechanics wise, fundamentals wise. I thought his feet, <clears throat> excuse me, looked a lot better uh, in the spring game as well. Like I just thought he looked more comfortable as a, as a quarterback, more looked more comfortable throwing the football. We know what he can do with his legs. Right. And so whether or not we talk Dylan Raiola, Heinrich Harburg, or anybody else in that room, there's that added uh, curiosity of, okay, what does now Heinrich Harburg give you in the passing game that is intriguing because now also going down a hypothetical road is if something happens to the starter or if, if Dylan Raiola is a starter, if anybody else is in that, in that room as the starter, there's not going to be this dramatic drop-off between, between QB1 and QB2 that Nebraska's had year after year, it feels like. Feels like there's mm-hmm. a little bit more of a, of a uh, lesser of a gap between those couple of guys in that room, and that should be intriguing and exciting for Oscar fans. 
So it's interesting. I saw Matt Rule's comments, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago at this point, where he thought maybe people were a little too harsh on Marcus Satterfield last fall, or I forget the exact mm-hmm. words. I agreed and disagreed. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't. nobody disagrees with Matt Rule nowadays. Everyone's drinking the Kool-Aid, me included. I'm not drinking the whole glass, but I'm about halfway down. But yeah. I, you know, I'll be one of the few guys that'll disagree with him. Now, I'm going to agree with him in the in the aspect of the injuries on the offense were not talked about enough. They were talked about last year, but not yeah. enough. We had true freshmen starting a wide receiver. We legit had like eight or nine different guys starting on the O-line. Like, all of that is true. Yeah. All of that is fair. Okay, where I disagree with with Coach Rule just a little bit is he was the guy coaching the quarterbacks, and the quarterbacks played worse than anybody on the entire offense last year. Yeah. And if it was too much for him to coach quarterbacks and be the offensive coordinator, and I know Rule wanted him to be the tight ends coach, which he is now, but that's not the way you yeah. set it up. If that's the job you're hired to do, you got to do it. And if Rule, if that's the way you set it up and you didn't think it was best, that's on Rule too. I know nobody's allowed to criticize or yeah. say anything not a thousand percent. It's a positive about Rule right now. Okay, but I'll be the guy that does it. What are your thoughts on my comments? Well, and that's the thing, right? It is, it's so unfortunate because we heard in, in spring and in the fall leading up to the first game that Jeff Sims was going to be the answer, right? This is the guy I, – I, I think people forget that Jeff Sims was the guy that this staff handpicked out of the transfer portal. Yep. We, yep. we talk so often about how there's just a large group of quarterbacks without homes. There's a lot of options out there. It's almost there's no excuse not to hit on a quarterback. And I think it does hurt or taint the uh, the the image initially of this staff when they handpicked Jeff Sims. Now, mm-hmm. Jeff Sims dealt with injuries. We know that. Like Certainly he played poorly at times, but there was also scenarios and situations where he was banged up. The, the, the guys behind Jeff Sims, you can't expect a staff to come in and revamp all four or five guys that are on scholarship in a single room also – and say, okay, you need to be ready in the next three months to play football. That's not that's not necessarily what we were getting at. So you have to be realistic, but you also have to be critical. It's okay to be critical as mm-hmm. well. Um, I would agree with you, Adam, because here's the thing is, is that's the job you're hired to do, and this is a results-driven business, like we talk so often about. And and, and you have to you have to provide results. And at Nebraska, we've learned over the last 10, 15 years, just mediocre results get the job done because they haven't been mediocre over the last 10 to 15 years. And so ultimately at the end of the day, I think this year is a big teller, right? Because now it's the, the, the jump from year one to year two. I think when you look around at the roster, you say, okay, th- they have the coaching staff situated where they want to be um, mm-hmm. with, with obviously Glenn Thomas at quarterbacks coach, and then Marcus Satterfield moving back to tight ends. I also think Josh Martin did a pretty good job in his role as tight ends coach last year. I thought from a holistic view, the offense struggled. It's not like it was all on the quarterback. A big part of it was, though. I mean, here's the deal. Your running game last year was led by a quarterback with 475 rushing yards. Yep. Where's all your running backs? Like, you can look at every single position group, and certainly, like you mentioned, the wide receivers. Certainly, that's something to mention uh, with the younger coach and Garrett McGuire over there. But there was a lot of issues, a lot of issues. The best group on that offensive side of the ball last year, in my eyes, was the offensive line. And, and Donovan Raiola, if we want to talk about coaches that might not get enough credit, Donovan Rylo is on that list for me. So it's it's interesting. With we'll put a button on the quarterbacks, and then I actually want to go to wide receivers next. It's actually next on my list. So I think yeah. it's fair to say you're not going to revamp an entire quarterbacks room, and not even a full year, just an off season. Okay, which is what they had a year ago. Mm-hmm. And maybe when you're trying to hire an entire staff, you can't get it exactly the way that you want. So maybe you don't have the exact location of each coach position wise that you're looking for when you're trying to hire ten guys. Okay, as opposed to, hey, let's just bring in Glenn Thomas and make one move this offseason, so to speak. So I think that's fair. I think where I struggle is every quarterback came in and played bad. We couldn't find one, just one. Now, let's be honest. If Dylan Raiola comes out and plays well this year and next year and Latif or Kalen or whoever comes in and plays well, about five, six years from now, people are going to be like, what happened that first year? Satterfield coached the quarterback? Sims was – nobody's going to remember. All that matters is what happens going forward. All right, man. Wide receivers. And this was intriguing to me because Jalen Lloyd, Malachi Coleman, insanely talented guys, guys who can make plays, guys who did do things last year, started as true freshmen, but neither one of them may start this. They they both may start, but neither one of them may start this year, which is an upgrade to hopefully the quarterback room, the wide receivers room, hopefully every room on the, I'm having, I'm looking around and I'm like, which room is not better than it was a year ago. I'm trying to find one. 
But talk to me about Isaiah Nair, Jamal Banks, and the possibility of having a bunch of really athletic wide receivers. Well, I, I think, I mean, Nebraska as a program has benefited over the last couple of years, now spanning different staffs of going and getting wide receivers out of the portal. Like, I think I think where we've moved on from this negative connotation that's assigned to going and getting top talent in the portal and that it's bad and that you don't develop, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the narrative anymore. And, and I think it's mm -hmm. good for from a holistic view for college football that that's not the narrative anymore because that's just not where we're at. So Nebraska's in a spot where, as a program, they've benefited from the transfer portal at the wide receiver position mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. Billy Kemp, I, I'm going to put him in his own separate group just because he was banged up last year. I thought he was undersized for the Big Ten. Also, the role that I think Nebraska was trying to have him be as the number one wide receiver not necessarily fit his style of play, and that's okay. So once again, mm -hmm. there's I think that's going back to our previous comments. That's also a, a, an unfortunate indication or, or feeling on year one was it was like, okay, you missed on your quarterback, you missed on the wide receiver, offense, offense isn't flashy. How do you feel about that? Now, back to this this current topic at hand, this year, I think Jamal Banks and, and Isaiah Nayor, for that matter, has the opportunity to have that Samari Toure impact. And mm -hmm. that's how I feel. I truly do. And, and, and we remember how important Samari Toure was for that offense, we remember how important Trey Palmer was for another offense. And the reason I say Samari Toure more so than than uh, Trey Palmer, Trey Palmer wasn't necessarily proven at the college level mm -hmm. yet. Um, yep. We knew he had, he had shown flashes in the special teams game, but at the wide receiver position, not necessarily proven there. Samari Toure was at, at Montana. So oh, I, I think Jamal Banks is, is certainly going to be your wide receiver one going into the season. However, I also don't think Nayor is far behind. I think there's other guys in that room. Like you mentioned, Malachi Coleman coming off the injury. You have other guys in Jeremiah Charles who is going back and forth from wide receiver and DB. You also have uh, uh, the guy out of uh, Florida who had a good spring game that I'm blanking on the name, Ja'Cory Vardy Jr., who mm -hmm. had a nice spring game yep. that I think could make an impact as a freshman. To your point, Adam, I think you hit it on the head where you look around at every single room, especially the wide receivers, and go, how did this room not get better? And the the biggest bugaboo for Nebraska football over the last decade or so has been the force of you have to come in and be able to play day one because we don't have depth. Nebraska doesn't have depth mm -hmm. at a lot of receiver, at a lot of position groups. I think Nebraska and Matt Rule are starting to get away from that. And now, not that there's not pressure to perform, but there's competition in the room. Yes. And that that benefits everybody from freshman, sophomore. It's all the way to, you know, six-year seniors now with COVID seasons. You're right. The competition forces – it gives you depth, but it forces you to earn your job day in and day out. So high tide raises all ships. You have to fight for your job. You're trying to be the starter. Okay, am I going to be the starter second string? Am I going to fall way off? Everybody has to compete. So you make and, a great point about – oh, go ahead. Sorry, Adam. I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I think to, to build off of your comment there – like that all starts at transparency with, with transparency at the top with Matt rule mm -hmm. and with position group coaches, right? Because if they aren't truthful to a wide receiver about where they stand on the depth chart, then that's just going to cause issues, right? Cause mm -hmm. then let's say, let's say you're the starting wide receiver and I'm number two in that room. I know going into practice, I am one spot away. I am one spot away. I yep. need to be better than Adam character and everybody else in that room today. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's not truly the case and the coaches are just telling me that, I'm going to go out and try to outperform guys, and I feel like, okay, coaches are telling me I'm doing well, but I'm still not seeing any playing time on Saturdays. That's where that's where roads and, yep. and lines can get crossed, and that's when you start to, to lose guys to the transfer portal and attrition for various reasons. To that point, Nebraska lost just nine, I believe, scholarship guys in the portal this year. Um, still got some roster things to work out, but they'll be just fine. You make a great point about being upfront and honest. Like, my true freshman year – I knew that there was Chris Kelsey in front of me and then Justin Smith and two other seniors and then Bernard Thomas and then Trevor Johnson. And I was battling with Jay Moore for, for time. Like I was, I was going to redshirt. I knew that as a redshirt freshman, I knew it was Bernard and Trevor. And then me and Jay were trying to back up. They brought in Wally Muhammad. And so we were all competing, you know, so it was very, very transparent where you were, where you were trying to get, where you were at the bottom, middle, top. The only time I ever felt lied to was going into my first game against Oklahoma State as, as a retro freshman at home. And I was told by a particular coach that I was going to see 15 to 20. He said the perfect number would be 18 snaps in the game tomorrow. I saw zero. 
I was not happy about that. I was pissed about yeah. that. I actually was telling my son the other day, Jacob, about this. It just randomly came up because he was frustrated. I think something with his club baseball team. And I was like, you know, it would have been better had he just said nothing or just said you're not going to play at all, which no coach is ever going to say because then you just come unprepared. But the fact that I had this expectation, then it was zero. Like that's the maddest I was ever, ever at and during my career at Nebraska because I felt lied to. I felt misled. And it's actually the only time I ever contemplated transferring because I love Nebraska and obviously I didn't, but I did not like playing for a guy who was lying to me is how I felt anyways. But the yeah. transfer portal, I thought you made a great point earlier because I think initially there's always resistance to something new, especially something that's drastically different. And I love Matt Rule's at least what his approach appears to be, which is he wants to build through high school guys and he wants to build through development. That's what he wants to do. But you're always going to have missing pieces here and there. It's kind of like an NFL team building yeah. through the draft. And then, hey, we're missing a wide receiver. Let's use that when we sign our, our free agent guy. Or we're missing a defensive end, a pass rusher. You can kind of find those missing pieces through free agency. Free agency in the NFL, free agency in college football is a transfer portal. What are your thoughts on how Matt Rule is using the transfer portal and how some schools, Colorado, are using it as well? Well, <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. I, I think when you look at – at Nebraska is more specifically um, it's some of the skill positions, right? And, and quarterback is obviously one that gets talked about. Nebraska just gets the commitment of TJ Latif. And I think that could be puzzling for some Husker fans because you go, well, you just got a five-star quarterback in Dylan Ryle. Do you not expect him to be here? Right. Then all these rumors and speculation starts flying about, okay, what's why is Dylan not going to be your quarterback next year? Or who's transferring out of that room next season? Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be the case. I think, Matt Rule and his staff are operating with this like supreme amount of confidence that number one, it's all going to work out no matter what. Number mm -hmm. two is that it's they're, they're building this. I hate to use the word culture because it's so overused in today when we're mm -hmm. talking about college athletics, but they're building this culture to where it's okay. If you don't want to be here, we don't necessarily want you. We don't need you to be here. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a fan is screaming behind me, so I hope you're that good. wasn't too loud. But over, otherwise, yeah, over, oh, oh, uh, otherwise, um, it, it's like they're creating this culture of like, if you don't want to be part of this, then we are bigger than one person, right? So many people say mm -hmm. that it's like no person in this program or department will be bigger than the entire department. So ultimately, I think that was a perfect example, right? You bring in one of the highest rated recruits in Nebraska football history. You bring in after one of the biggest college football stories. In, in recruiting in the last probably 10 years um, in, in Dylan Raiola last season. And what do you do? One of your first commits in the top 20 or in the 2025 classes for a quarterback. I think that just goes to show that they're building competition. They're building depth. They're mm -hmm. trying to bring in guys that are going to push, whether you're a three-star coming out of high school, whether you're a transfer out of an NAIA program, or you're a five-star recruit, you're going to get pushed every single day. And I feel like that's something that, Husker fans can kind of hang their hat on when looking at that right? and that rule and how this staff operates. They're operating with the confidence that it's like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna recruit the heck out of high school guys. We have feel like we have good ties to high schools and to programs in other states. But then also we're gonna kind of mix and match. We're gonna go and piece some things together as some positions that might take us from eight wins to nine wins or eight, nine wins to ten wins eventually. And I feel like that's what they did, right? They went out and got Jamal Banks and, and Isaiah Nayor. They went out and got Stephon Thompson on the defensive side. They went out and got Bly Hill, who's already in a loaded defensive back room. So you look around, and I think it's added competition, number one, but it's also guys that can can come in, and whether they're under-recruited, over-recruited, can come in and make some plays day one. So it's interesting. With the current quarterback situation, all right, we have three scholarship quarterbacks, two of true freshmen, no breaking news there. But I had a coach look at me while I was up in the, the football building chatting with some of the coaches the day before the spring game. He goes, one of these guys leaves. We're hurting. Like, you're down to two scholarship quarterbacks. And depending on who it is, you might have two true freshmen or whatever the case may be. And I'm not saying anybody's leaving or anything like that. It's just the reality of the situation. The transfer portal is very real. And so, like you said, bringing in more talent, never a bad thing. Competition it creates, which is a good thing. But if you don't know when somebody's going to leave. OK, somebody might take off and leave. And so you need to have more guys ready and waiting in the wings. I'm impressed. But I don't I want to say the sell job because that makes it sound like they fooled somebody. But they were able to commit to a quarterback and get a quarterback to commit to them with such a young, loaded talent quarterback room. So that talks about the culture, even that they're building within yeah. recruiting 
and and getting recruits to buy into what Matt Rule is doing and everything you just talked about? Let's be honest. That goes back to that transparency piece, right? Because yep. that's that's you can't promise TJ Latif that he's gonna he's gonna start day one like you you would have to to some quarterbacks nowadays, and I, I don't think that they promised to Dylan Raiola that he was gonna come in and start. I think they're promising the opportunity to compete, mm-hmm. and I think that also is the right type of players that Nebraska needs. Right, is the ones that don't want to get promised to start right away. They want to come in and, and compete. Right, everybody's talking about how Nebraska needs to get back to this hard nose, you know. Iron sharpens iron mentality of a football team. That's exactly what you're doing when you're bringing in multiple highly rated quarterbacks year after year after year. And I also think when you're looking at TJ Latif specific, specifically, I think quarterbacks in a class give you an opportunity to have a peer recruiter to look to, um, to recruit some other guys to say, hey, I'm going to be your quarterback in three years. But once again, it goes back to that transparency piece of, all right, TJ, you're, this is the plan for you. This is the four-year plan. Now, it might have some speed bumps in the road, but we're going to redshirt you. Nowadays in college football, that still means that you can play in four games. You're still mm-hmm. going to play in this spring game. You're still going to get all the benefits of it. You're still going to be on scholarship. And you're going to be able to learn behind Dylan or, you know, learn behind experienced quarterbacks, but then also Dylan Raiola, who we'd expect to probably start this season. So it's you have opportunities and this plan is clearly laid out. Now Nebraska just has to do this, their part and stick with the plan. And so that way it doesn't come across as, oh, you lied to me or you misled me from my recruiting process. So that's a great point because eventually what is going to happen as these rooms become more and more loaded with more and more talented and highly rated guys, eventually you're going to see more people transfer. Okay. That's just what's going to happen yeah. down the road right now. There's competition, but there's a little bit more separation until more depth and more talent comes in. So if a couple of years from now, we're sitting here with 18 transfers, you know, twice as many as we are right now, I don't think it's a reason to freak out. That's just the way college football works. And it means, I mean, look at Georgia, Alabama was different because Saban left, but look at some of these other schools where players leave because the, the rooms are so loaded. So just kind of looking down the road and preventing any potential, oh my God, we had nine transfers year two and now we've got 18. It's, you know, it's, it's part of the process. Mm-hmm. It's interesting well, when you talk about. Oh, uh, just let me let me wrap it up real quick. The only thing I was going to say, it's interesting when you talk about yeah. guys wanting to be there. OK, so I, 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 I'm I well, coaching my 28. Yes. I was just going to say I'm coaching my 28 youth perfect... sports team right now. Yeah. And I'll, mm-hmm. I'll text to people, you know, um, when I'm building a team to start with. Once the team is kind of, you know, got got mm-hmm. some players, I won't say this, but I'll say if you're interested in joining, like I'm coaching an 8U baseball team right now. If you're interested in joining our team, they're eight year olds. Yeah, I'm, I'm not one of these crazy coaches. We got to do this 12 months out of the year. I do it yeah. more in my job because I've seen that. And that's asinine. But I will say we're interested in people who are interested in, you know, committing to the team. And if you're if you're not interested in that, no problem. Go play for someone else. But I'll put that in an initial text, even to eight year old parents, because that sets the tone and culture from the very beginning. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Last thing before before we get out of here. It's just that I think that one big poor important piece of that is when you were talking about um, uh, right there about the uh the culture of it is mm-hmm. like when we get freaked out with the with the transfer portal numbers and if let's say hypothetically nebraska does lose 20 guys next year i think you can also chalk some of those guys up to saying okay if they number one didn't want to be here or didn't fit the program or like that is nebraska showing that they will not be bigger than nebraska and that mm-hmm. is once again what everybody is clamoring for nebraska to get back to and so try not to panic hesitate on the whole oh no the sky is falling chicken little type of response because everything's going to be okay and nebraska frankly has utilized the transfer portal nebraska is one of these teams that in past years has been able to go out and get transfer portals in large quantities everything's going to be fine but for right now give credit to matt rule and staff because uh, they only lost nine guys in the portal for sure i want to thank you for joining me today nick good job calling these games hopefully the voice is strong for you ladies and gentlemen you can give him a follow on twitter at nick underscore saner that's s-e-h-n-e-r-t all right thank you nick for joining me welcome back everyone to the big 10 show or the big 10 show on the believe podcast network all right if you missed it i just had a great conversation with sports media personality in the great state of nebraska nick saner we debated all the other quarterbacks not named Dylan Raiola. We debated why Heinrich Harburg looks better, why bringing in a four-star quarterback when you just brought in a four- and a five-star quarterback this past year is a good thing. 
the competition, the depth, okay, the culture, I know, the C word, not that C word, the other C word that's become a bad word somehow. But if you're creating a positive culture, it becomes not only a good word, a great word. Debated all those things. If you missed that, go back and check it out. All right. So two weeks ago, I talked about how I was going to talk about the G5 teams and should they form their own league and should they form their own playoff. And then I saw this thing online because I've talked about a potential college football super league, okay, in the past couple of days, a better college football super league proposal. So I'm going to talk about that. And at the end, <clears throat> at the end, excuse me, if I have time to talk about the G5 teams and their own playoff, because they're incorporated in this new potential college football playoff proposal, how they would be handled. I will talk about that today. If I don't get to them, I will talk about them next week. We got a whole summer of <laughs> to talk about a whole lot of stuff, ladies and gentlemen. But in the meantime, all right, you can check out all my personal con uh, content at Character Chronicles on YouTube. You got nothing better to do with your time. Go to the tube of you. Type in YouTube.com and you type in Character Chronicles and you will see my lovely face. Probably not wearing many V-necks on that show, right? But if you can, you can check it out if you'd like or you can go to Character Chronicles dot com the website that is ever expanding we are adding 15 new content contributors to characterchronicles.com which means we will have 20 plus total content contributors to characterchronicles.com come august 1st you can go there now great content now come august 1st it's ever growing ever expanding appreciate the love and support you find folks the people have shown us over the years all right let's chat a better college football super league proposal so I'm going to read a lot of this, all right, and a story written by Drew Crabtree, okay, and I'm going to offer my thoughts as we go along, and I'll offer my thoughts at the end. Now, college football has been ever-changing. In a less than 30 short years, we've gone from the Bowl Coalition to Bowl Games, period, to the BCS, to the four-team college football playoff, and we actually haven't had the 12-team college football playoff yet, have we? We're going there for like, I don't know, a year or two. And then we're going to a 14-team college football playoff. So naturally, why would this process not continue to change? All right. So enter a new proposal to the College Football Super League, which, ladies and gentlemen, this is coming. Whether it's two years from now, eight years from now, 12 years from now, this is coming because this is the most profitable way to conduct college football. And college football is all about money. Okay. And it's always been a business. They've always just been better at hiding the fact that they're a pure business than the NFL. The NFL, you know, for business purposes and for brand purposes, talks about player safety. They don't give a crap about player safety. Trust me. Thursday night games and all these things that they do. Trust me. They do not care. Adding more games. You know what? You want to add more games? If I was a current player, I'd say, cool, just give us another bye week. But they don't do that because you don't make money off teams that aren't playing. So, I don't, don't fall into this facade of player safety that the NFL sells. My point is college football is a pure business. It's always been that way, and you're starting to see that as well. It's beyond being undeniable. All right. College football is one of the biggest economic forces in the United States. It's become more of a national brand rather than a regionally focused commodity, which it was for years, hence why the Pac-12 is no more. Okay, hence why L.A. teams are going to play teams from Piscataway, New Jersey, Happy Valley, all the way up in Penn State. And for the love of all that's holy, Cal and Stanford, teams uh, next to the Pacific Ocean are playing in a conference next to the Atlantic Ocean. And they're going to play teams like Miami and Clemson and North Carolina, at least for a year or two, until the ACC is no longer around, because that's happening too. But I digress. Topic for another day, which we will cover. All right, but it's one of the biggest economic forces in the United States. It's no longer regional. You make it more national, just like Vince McMahon did with WWE back in the day. There was, you know, there was Mid-South, Mid-Atlantic, the OVW, Ohio Valley Wrestling, all these regional wrestling companies. And Vince McMahon Sr., Vince McMahon's dad, okay, when, he, when Vince, he didn't give his company to his son, Vince McMahon Jr. When Vince McMahon Jr. bought it from his dad, Vince McMahon Sr. went around to all the regional companies across America, said, my son will not compete with you. And that is 100% what he believed because that is what he was told by his son. And so he was saying something he believed to be true. Vince McMahon Jr. did not follow through on that promise, crapped all over everybody, destroyed everybody, put everybody else out of business and created not the national brand, the international brand known as the WWE. And I know Vince McMahon's got all these 
allegations and everything else that ain't so pretty surrounding him right now. Uh, but that's that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm simply saying college football is doing something very, very similar. They're destroying all the regional competition that used to be around, and they're making their themselves the most profitable company business that they can be in. They're making themselves into a national commodity. All right? I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's good. It just is what it is. The facts are what the facts are, and the facts don't care about feelings, obviously. Just ask the Pac-12 conference. Just ask the ACC in about a couple years, if it takes that long for them to not be around. Okay. Attempting to make it so that the cream always rises to the top is what college football is doing. And replicating, and I actually like this, a Premier League-esque model only makes sense. For decades, college football has thrived off of what if or even. In other words, could 2019 LSU beat 2001 Miami? Okay, with a better college football super league than what has already been proposed earlier this year would make those discussions even better. Imagine a system where the Blue Bloods are in a division of their own, battle it out yearly and have to keep it keep up with each other or risk relegation. So how the Premier League works in soccer, and I love this, is, all right, if you are not in the top league, well, if you are in the top league, you can't go up because you're in the top league. But if you're in the bottom three of that top league, you're going to fall down to the second tier league. If you're in the top three of the second tier league, you're going to go up to the top league. And you can be relegated. You can be promoted, go up or down in each league every year. Every It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you went undefeated, won the championship a year ago. If you're in the bottom three the next year, bam, you're going down. You're being relegated to the next lower tier, tier division league. I love that. It makes every game matter so much more. Let, let, let's say Indiana this year, for example. Three and nine. Okay, out of the 18 teams in the Big Ten, they're third from the bottom. Well, guess what? Now your game versus Purdue at the end of the year that hardly anybody outside of Indiana watches. I apologize for the truth being spoken. Not really. Now, all of a sudden, it matters, and everybody's interested because the team sitting fourth from the bottom could be Nebraska, could be whoever, Michigan State. Now, those fans are interested. Fifth from the bottom is interested. Now, Michigan State's end-of-the-year game versus Penn State, which is the way it currently is, all of a sudden, that game matters so much more. Now, so many more teams are interested. There's a constant demand to be at the top of your game. Even more so than there's ever been. It makes every game much more interesting. Not just the top, not just the middle. Those teams trying to get into the 14-team eventual college football playoff. It's now the teams at the bottom. It makes every game matter so much more. All right. Right now, college football likes to pride itself on any given Saturday type of idea where any of the 130-plus FBS programs could win a national championship. As any fan of a mid-tier Power 4 or any Group of 5 program would tell you, it's simply not true. The game of football that George is playing on any given Saturday, with all due respect, okay, is not quite the same as what Akron is putting on display as well. All right. The consolidation of power, as we know, has already begun in college, the College Football Super League, which is honestly cut to the chase. It would get to the end, which we all know was coming just sooner, right? The Big Ten and SEC are locked in a nuclear arms race reminiscent of the Cold War. Meanwhile, the Big 12 is sitting there cannibalizing anybody who's left from the Pac-12, soon to be ACC. All right. The group of five is constantly on edge, okay, attempting to keep its best players, starters, stars from transferring or going to top programs and from getting them poached. They're just trying to have a seat at the table. They're glad they get one automatic team in every year right now, the college football 12-team system, the 14-team system, although that's not actually been finalized at all, just who's going to make what money because that's all they care about. I care about the game. And maybe I'd care more if I was getting paid too, but I still care about the game more because the game of college football has been my favorite game to watch since I was a kid. It'll, it'll be that way till the day I die. So I care more about what's best for the sport. That's not what they care about. They care about money. So that's the only thing they figured out about the 14-team college football playoff. That, that's it. Nothing else. They'll get to everything else when they get to it. They got their primary thing figured out. Realistically, college football needs to be saved from itself in a way. All right. Now, according to the individual who wrote this, current proposal is weak for the college football Super League. And I'm not going to argue with that. A group calling itself College Football Sports Tomorrow, made up of high-ranking individuals and institutions who could be left behind has come up with its own proposal. Their attempt has a framework of seven divisions of 10 teams, including 70 of college football's historically best teams. Now, if you look at the amount of power five teams that currently exist, okay, 
there's there's roughly 60 mid 60s okay i knew the exact number a month ago and then i don't know 18 things happened it, it's a mid 60s all right i was gonna make a joke but it wasn't gonna be very good so i stopped there's almost 70 power five college football teams and let's be honest they're, they're going to keep grabbing the best G5 teams and adding to the power conferences so some of these power conferences can make more money and or just stay around. So there's going to be 70 soon. Anyways, those teams, all right, would be immune from relegation. There would be an eighth division made up of group five, group of five overachievers, but the best group of five teams, essentially. It would be from that group, programs would be relegated to tier two. Tier two would have 50 of the next programs, okay, and would get the opportunity to fight it out to be promoted into the constellation division the proposal kind of smells like the, the 2008 housing crisis where the banks that caused the crash were deemed too big to fail it would be the same in this college football super league proposal if a program is deemed too big to fail they are safe from relegation despite a one-win season okay there's more to this article about that particular subject later on plain and simple no prog program should be safe oh here's the later on it came sooner than i remembered no no program should be safe if ohio state gets Railroad and it ends up two and ten with their only wins coming from group of five competition. They should absolutely be at risk. College football is cyclical. I mean, look at look, look at Miami. Five national championships. They're really good, then they're really bad, then they're really good, then they're really bad. Then they get 10 wins, and then they have a couple of six win seasons. It's very cyclical up and down. Look at my alma mater, which I love, Nebraska. Okay, the last 20 years was not the same as the previous 40 years. All right, teams go up and down. Look at Michigan, just won three straight. All right, games against Ohio State, Big Ten Championships, won a national championship, went undefeated last year. Okay, their era under Rich Rod, not so great. Okay, so teams go up and down. So just because you're a national brand, you could possibly be relegated up or down based on how you're currently doing. I personally like that, all right? I don't know that the TV networks are going like to that, like that because TV networks like brands. Again, this is a proposal, things that are talked about. Uh, I'm pretty sure... That Fox, even if Michigan's sitting there at three and eight, maybe Ohio State's you know nine and two. I'm pretty sure Fox wants Michigan to play Ohio State because they're brands, and the Michigan brand at three and eight would probably bring in more money than a phenomenal G5 brand in Boise State, even if they were ten and one. I think that's the brands matter more, but that's per this particular proposal. All right. Where this proposal is sound, according to the writer, is in its CFP. There's, there has eight division champions, and then the next eight best teams would get in via wild card. So this is clearly a 16-team playoff system he's talking about, which we're eventually going to get to. I just hope we stop at 16. We go beyond 16. Ugh. All right, it throws a bone to the group of five consolation divisions and expands the tournament to 16 teams. And all, College Sports Tomorrow proposal shows the Power Four conferences are scared of being passed over or exposed the name college football super league implies that the premier league of college football should be the absolute cream of the crop and should be able to stand on its own so it's just so you're not confused i'm i'm going through this article and interjecting my thoughts in with his thoughts as well okay all right criteria for college football's premier league according to the writer criticism without a plan is just complaining anyone can hop on social media and call and call college sports tomorrow's proposal trash but re rarely does anyone pony up a better framework that's what this proposal is i would agree with that I hate it when people just say, no, 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 complain, whine, complain, whine, no. If you don't have an idea or thought of your own, just be quiet. That's my opinion. I don't care if your idea or thought is wrong or horrible. At least you've got one. And nothing annoys me more when someone just said, no, 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 no. That And with no ideas of their own. Okay. All right. To start, there are a number of logistical issues that need ironing out when it pertains to this, pro this proposal, according to the writer. 80 schools at the top of the college football super league is too many, in his opinion. Are there 80 programs in a given year that can win the national title? He says no, and it would just water down the product. The purpose of this Super League is to find the dog among dogs. Never heard that. I like that. The cream of the crop and the bluest of the blue bloods. Tier 1, which could be considered the premier league of college football, would have 40 teams. Those 40 teams would be divided up into geogra geographically into four 10-team divisions with the nature of promotion and relegation. So this is what he is proposing versus what was proposed. The previous proposal, okay, just had 80 teams, no relegation, no promotion. He wants a couple, some divisions with promotion and relegation involved no matter who or what your school or brand name is. All right. 
The tier one, which would be considered the Premier League of College Football, would have 40 teams. Those 40 teams would be divided up geographically into four 10-team divisions with the nature of promotion and relegation, much like soccer, which I actually like. These divisions could vary minimally from year to year and would likely need to be slightly realigned every now and then. The most important thing, no program is immune from relegation. If Alabama and Georgia end up in the danger zone, they're sent down to tier two, tier three, okay? just like anyone else, according to his proposal. I actually like that. I don't think it's very realistic because Alabama's brand is always going to trump a UCF or a Boise State. I don't think TV networks are going to go for this, but let's just throw the money out. Let's throw the TV networks out. Let's talk about what's best for the sport, and that's what he's getting at. The college football playoff, okay, in his opinion, would feature 12 teams. The four division champions, the top, so there's tier one, four divisions, 10 teams in each division. So the champion of each division, okay, is what he's talking about, would earn buys, and the next eight best programs would earn wild card bids. In order to prevent certain programs from getting easier passes than others, there would be a uniform scheduling. Each team would have a 12 team schedule that features nine games against other divisional programs. Makes sense. One of the non conference games would be a division versus division challenge of sorts. I like that. You ever seen the ACC Big Ten Challenge in college basketball? Love that. Okay, it could pit the West Division's champion from the previous season against the South Division's champion and so on down the standings. By the way, that's a lot how the NFL scheduling works. If you're the NFC East champion from the previous season, you're going to play the NFC South champion the upcoming year. Okay, now he's going to talk about how that kind of creates a variance in the scheduling difficulty. But the NFL does that because you're going to get bigger name teams versus bigger name teams, which creates better TV ratings. But let's get back to what he's talking about. One of the non-conference games, would be against a tier two foe, and the final would be against a tier three foe. All right, so everyone from each tier gets a chance to play someone else from each tier. That way, the lower level programs can still get their payday games while getting a crack at the big boys. The bottom eight programs would end up relegated, whereas the top eight of the lower level would be promoted. So the top, I'm sorry, the bottom eight programs, according to this, of tier one would be relegated to tier two, and the top eight programs from pre- tier two the previous season would go up to tier one. Okay, I hope that all makes sense. Hope we're all tracking so far. All right, let's see. I lost my trap. For the lower tiers, their college football playoff would be the same. The only kicker would be whoever wins that tier's college football playoff is automatically promoted, regardless of whether or not they were one of the top eight regular season teams. Okay, now he's talking about a 12 team college football playoff for each tier, as I gather. I had not put that together before. So you'd actually have, I think he's talking about like two, three tiers. But you have a 12-team college football playoff for each tier. That's interesting. I don't think I like that. That's too much. That's diluting the product, in my opinion. But let's keep going. All right, selection process. Since the idea of this proposal is to get the top programs in all of history isolated into a single Super League, Tier 1, standards of selection must be set. Not every current Power 4 program is among the game's elite. Even if they are elite today, they do not have the historical backing. Man, that's such a hard thing to do. How do you compare programs that are really good right now but weren't in the past to programs who were good in the past but maybe not so strong right now all right clemson they've had a great i I know not not the past couple of years they've still won what eight nine ten games multiple national championship games multiple national championships because you go back the past 50 years they're not as strong as some other programs but there are some programs. i mean nebraska be a perfect example of this you know maybe not as strong the past 20 years as they were the previous 40 years. So how do you find that balance? Man, that would be tough. I think that'd be the toughest thing of all this. Okay. Let's see. Let's go on to the next one. All right. So with this in mind, the selection of the top tier will not be based on the current win percentage, but on an all-time win percentage over current FBS programs and teams being compared to each other. For the most part, the top 40, (coughs) excuse me, teams remain unchanged. Since so James Madison, as an example, technically has a 6667 win percentage with this new model, the stipulation of 600 FBS games must be met, which they have not they have not played. The next part is tricky. If you sort all-time win percentage versus FBS teams and include the four teams who do not meet the minimum game threshold, there are 13 programs without national championships. Whereas outside of this newly established top 40, there are 15 programs with the title. If we are to create a new Premier League, we have to reward programs that have won over the course of time, which bodes good for Nebraska. And I think Clemson gets into this, too, because overall they've been a good program. I'm just talking about being at the top. Okay, very, very top. In all reality, the first grouping 
is about rewarding those programs. It will all level out with promotion and relegation. So here are some of the teams they have in. It's the top 40. Okay, Arizona State, Colorado, Stanford, Oregon, USC, UCLA, Notre Dame, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas, Texas A&M, Tennessee. And so they have it laid out here. If you're on YouTube, you can see it real quick. That's tier one, kind of what it looks like. They got the West, the North, the South, the East divisions, all with 10 teams in them, all regionally based, but that's tier one. And for what I gather, you'd have a 12-team college football playoff championship among those 40 teams for tier one. Same thing with tier two. Some of the teams in tier two are Boise State, Ball State, Baylor, Boston College, Duke, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma State. Ooh, they're not going to like that. San Diego State, North Carolina State. All right, so those these are some of the teams, if you're on YouTube, you can see that are in tier two as he has it. Okay. And there's tier three, which is like Colorado State, Hawaii, New Mexico State, Arkansas State, Indiana, ouch, Iowa State, Kansas. Ooh, do we not factor basketball at all? Okay. So basically, and he's got a fourth tier. So basically, from what I gather, to surmise this, four tiers of college football playoff. You go back over the past, what do you say, 30, 40, 50 years, all-time winning percentage during that time, which I like. I think it's about the best way to do it. Top 40 teams, tier one. Next 40, tier two, tier three, and tier four. And so each tier has their own 12-team college football playoff. The four, div four division champs, because each team's going to have four tiers. Four divisions of 10 teams the top the four division champs automatically get the four, top four seeds with the bye the next eight spots in each tier each tier's 12 team college football playoff goes to the teams with the highest winning percentage okay the eight wild card spots so you have a champion of tier one tier two tier three tier four and if you're in the bottom eight of tier one winning percentage wise you're going to be relegated to tier two if you're in top eight winning percentage wise of 2024 you're going to go to tier one for 2025 now the only exception to this is if you're like the 12th seed in the tier two college football playoff you automatically are going to go to tier one if you win the whole thing if you win the whole national the championship for your tier which i guess means number eight then gets bumped out all right so that's kind of how it works i like it a lot of it i don't know if i'm crazy about a national championship for 12 teams for each tier i would narrow it down to eight the four division champs, four wild card teams. So you have an eight team playoff for tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. Okay. I love the relegation or the promotion based off you're in the bottom eight or you're in the top eight of your tier going up and down. I love that. Okay. So I love the relegation promotion. I actually like the four to the four tiers. I actually like having a championship among each tier. I love the fact that you can be promoted, you can be relegated. Okay. I love all that. The only thing I would do is I would I would have an eight-team college football playoff for each tier. And the only hitch in the giddy-up I realistically see, because those top 40 teams in tier one, I mean, we're talking Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, Nebraska would be in there going back to 50-year winning percentage over, over the last 40, 50 years. You, you're going to get the top brands versus each other. And then if a program falls off, okay, in tier one, you're going to go down. And then the top programs in tier two are going to hop up. I love that. You're constantly seeing the best of the best versus the best of the best. You're constantly being pushed to try to be not in the bottom eight, hopefully in the top eight to go up or to hopefully go up versus not down. It makes more games matter more. I love everything. And I actually think it could work even with money being the priority, even with networks holding all the cards now, TV networks and college football holding all the cards. The only hitch in the giddy up I see is even if Michigan goes three and nine and Boise State goes 11 and one TV execs are not going to want Michigan to fall to tier two and Boise State in tier one because those matchups just aren't going to be as exciting for the general fan I'll be honest with you for me I love the Cinderella story I love most of it I hope that makes sense all right ladies and gentlemen we'll be back and until next time this has been the Big Ten show as always check all my other stuff out at characterchronicles.com on YouTube Character Chronicles on YouTube, characterchronicles.com, the website. And until next time, this has been The Big Ten Show, The Big Ten Show on the Believe Podcast Network and 93.7 The Ticket. I'm Adam Character. Have a phenomenally phenomenal day.